Hey, this is chapter two of The Mountain Is You. And we're just reading together. So this is a listening practice and also a reading along exercise. Chapter two is quite long. And our plan is to read through the entire chapter. Not sure if we're going to make it. Uh, we might split it in two, depending on how it goes and the length of the video. But even if we split it in two, we'll get part one, part two. If we don't, it's going to be a straight video, just a one video, chapter two. So let's go. There is no such thing as self-sabotage. When you're habitual... When you... Habituate yourself to the things that move your life forward, you call them skills. When they hold you back in life, you call them self-sabotage. When are both the thing, essentially the same function? Sometimes it happens by accident. Sometimes we just get used to living in a certain way and fail to have a vision for how life could be different. Sometimes we make choices because we don't know how to make better ones or that anything else is even possible. Sometimes we settle for what we're handled um, because we don't know we can ask for more. Sometimes we run our lives on autopilot for long enough that we begin to think we no longer have a choice. However, most of the time, it's not accident at all. The habits and behaviors, you can't stop engaging in, no matter how destructive and limiting they might be. They may be. They might be. Are intelligently designed by your subconscious to meet an unfilled need, displaced emotion, or neglected desire. Overcoming self-sabotage is not about trying to figure out how to override your impulses. It is first determining why those impulses exist in the first place. Self-sabotage is often misunderstood to be a way in which we punish the right or intentionally hurt ourselves. On the surface, this seems true enough. Self-sabotage is committing to a healthier diet and find yourself pulling up to the drive through a few hours later. Later, It's identifying a market gap, convincing an unprecedentedly brilliant business idea, then getting discarded, forgetting to begin working on it. It's having strange and terrifying thoughts and allowing them to paralyze you in the face of important life, changing, life changes or milestone, milestones. It is knowing you have so much to be grateful for and excited about, and yet worrying anyway. We often misattribute those behaviors to a lack of intelligence, willpower, or capability. That's usually not the case. Self-sabotage is not a way we hurt ourselves. It's a way we try to protect ourselves. What is self-sabotage? Self-sabotage is when you have two conflicting desires. One is conscious, one is unconscious. You know how you want to move your life forward, and yet, you were still, for some reason, stuck. When you have big, ongoing, insumerable issues in your life, especially when this solution seems so simple, so easy, and yet so impossible to stick with. What you have, what you have are not big problems, but big attachments. People are pretty, pretty incredible in the fact that they basically do whatever they want to do. This is true for everything in human life, regardless of the potential consequences. Human nature has revealed itself to be incredibly self-serving. People have an 
almost superhuman way of doing whatever they feel compelled to, regardless of whom it could hurt, what wars it could spawn, and what future would be put at risk. When you consider this, you begin to realize that if you're keeping something in your life, there has to be a reason uh, you want it there. The only question is why? Some people can't figure out why they can't seem to motivate themselves enough to create a new business to facilitate their goals of becoming significantly wealthier, perhaps not realizing that they have a subconscious belief that to be rich is to be egocentric or disliked, or perhaps they actually don't want to be super wealthy. Maybe it's a cover up for wanting to feel secure and taken care of, or their desire is to be recognized for their art. And as this feels too unlikely to ever happen, they fall back on the secondary dream that doesn't actually motivate them. Some people say that they want to be successful at any cost, and yet don't want, don't want to log the hours of work it will take to get there. Perhaps it's because they understand at some level that being successful doesn't really make us happy or nor liked. In fact, the opposite tends to be true. Success usually exposes us to jealousy, scrutiny, scrutiny. Successful people are not loved in the way that we imagined they would be. They're usually picked apart because envious people need to humanize them in some way. Perhaps, instead of being successful, what many really want is just to be loved. And yet their ambition for success directly threatens that. Some people can't figure out why they keep choosing the wrong relationships. People whose patterns of rejection, abuse, or refusal to commit seems to be consistent. Perhaps they don't realize that they, they are actually recreating the relationship dynamics they experienced when they were young because they associate love with loss and abandon, abandonment. Perhaps they want to recreate family relationships in which they felt helpless, but to live them again as an adult where they can help the, the addict, the liar, or the broken person. When it comes to self-sabotaging behaviors, you have to understand that something, sometimes it's easy to get attached to having problems. Being successful can be less liked. Being successful can make you less liked. Finding love can make you more vulnerable. Making yourself less attractive can guard you. Playing small allows you to avoid scrutiny. Procrastinating puts you back in the place of comfort. All the ways in which you are self-sabotaging are actually ways you're feeding a need you probably do not even realize you have. Overcoming it is no is not only a matter of learning to understand yourself better, but realizing that your problems are not problems, they are symptoms. You cannot get rid of a coping mechanism and think you've solved the problem. What does self-sabotage look like? It's impossible to say decisively what self-sabotage does or doesn't look like because certain habits and behaviors that can be healthy for some, for one person can be unhealthy in another context. With that said, there are definitely some specific behaviors and patterns that are typically indicate, indicative of self-sabotage. And they usually relate to being aware that there is a problem in your life. Yet, feeling the need to perpetuate it regardless. Here are some of the main signs 
that you're probably in a cycle of, of self-sabotage. Resistance. Resistance is what happens when you have a new project that we need to work on and simply can't bring ourselves to do it. It's when we get into a great new relationship and then keep bailing on plans. It's when we get an amazing idea for our business and then feel tension and anger when it comes to sit down and actually get to work. We often feel resistance in the face of what's going right in our lives, not what's going wrong. When we have a problem to solve, resistance is usually nowhere to be found. But when we have something to enjoy, create, or build, we are tapping into the part, into a part of ourselves that is trying to thrive instead of just survive. And the unfamiliarity can be daunting. How to, how to resolve this? Resistance is your way of slowing down and making sure that it's safe to get attached to something new and important. In other cases, it can also be a warning sign that something isn't quite right. And you might need to step back and regroup. Resistance is not the same thing as procrastination or indifference and shouldn't be treated as such. When we are experiencing resistance, there's always a reason and we have to pay attention. If we try to force ourselves to perform in the face of resistance, it usually intensifies the feeling as we are strengthening the internal conflict and triggering the fear that's holding us back in the first place. Instead, releasing re resistance requires us to refocus. We have to get, to get clear on what we want and what we want, as well as when and why we want it. We have to identify unconscious beliefs that are preventing us from showing up. And then we have to set back in the work, into the work when we feel inspired, wanting to the entry way to showing up after resistance. Hitting your upper limit. As discussed before, there's only a certain amount of happiness that most of us we will allow ourselves to feel. Gay Hendrick calls this your upper limit. Your upper limit is essentially the amount of good that you're comfortable having in your life. It's your tolerance or threshold for having positive feelings or experiencing positive, positive events. When you begin to surpass your upper limit, you start to unconsciously sabotage what's happening in order to bring yourself back to what is comfortable and familiar. For some people, this manifests physically, often as aches, pains, headaches, or physical tension. For others, it manifests emotionally as resistance, anger, guilt, or fear. It might seem totally counterintuitive, but we are not really wired to be happy. We're wired to be comfortable. And anything that's outside of, of the realm of comfort feels threatening or scary until we are fa familiar with it. How to resolve this? Hitting your, your upper limit is a really great time. It means that you're approaching and surpassing new levels of, in your, of your life. And that is, first and foremost, something to congratulate yourself for. The way you resolve an upper limit problem is by slowly acclimating yourself to your new normal. Instead of shocking yourself into big challenges, allow yourself to slow slowly adjust and adapt. By taking it slow, 
you are allowing yourself to gradually reinstate a new comfort zone around what you want your life to be. Over time, you gradually shift your baseline to new stand, standard. Uprooting. Uprooting uh, happens when someone, someone finds themselves jumping from relationship to relationship or changing their business website again and again. When they really need to focus on confounding relationship issues when they arise or taking care of clients they already have. In uprooting, you are not allowing yourself to blossom. You're only comfortable with the process of sprouting. You might be constantly needing a fresh start, which is often the result of not, not having uh, healthy ways to deal with stress or struggling with, with conflict resolutions. Uprooting can be a way of diverting attention from the actual problems in your life as your attention must go forward, reestablishing yourself at a new job or in a new town. Ultimately, ultimately, uprooting means you're always just being your new chapter, but never really finishing it. Despite your efforts to keep moving on, you end up more stuck than ever before. How to resolve this? First, recognize the pattern. One of the primary symptoms of uprooting is not realizing that one is, that one is doing, it, doing it. Therefore, the most important step is to become aware of what's happening. Trace back your steps over the past few years. How many places have you moved or worked? Then figure out what is driving you away from each new thing you find. Next, you need to get a clear on, you need to get clear on what you really want. Sometimes uprooting occurs because we step too quickly towards what we think we want, only to find that we didn't think it through, and don't really want that thing very much. Clarity is key because you're thinking long-term now. What would, what would it look like to choose one place to live then build connections there? What would it look like to work at the same place and move up in your position or build your business? Remember that healing from an uprooting pattern is not about settling for something you don't want, nor is it about staying in an unsafe or unhealthy situation because you don't want to move again. It's about getting clear and determined on what's the right path for you, and then making a plan for how you can thrive, not just survive. When the, when the moment comes that you would typically flee comfort, confront, confront the discomfort and stay where you are. Figure out why you were uncomfortable getting attached to one thing or another and determine what a healthy attachment would look like for you. Perfectionism, mm -hmm. that's a big one. When we expect that our work must be perfect the first time we do it, we end up getting into a cycle of perfectionism. Perfectionism isn't actually wanting everything to be right. It's not a good thing. In fact, it is a hindering thing because it sets you up unrealistic expectations about what we are capable of or what 
the outcomes for our lives could be. Perfectionism holds us back from showing up and trying or really doing the important work of our lives. This happens because when we are afraid of failing or feeling vulnerable or not being as good as we want others to think, we are, other things we are, we end up avoiding the work that is required to actually become that good. We sabotage ourselves because it's the willingness to show up and simply do it again and again and again that ultimately brings us to a place of mastery. How to resolve this? Don't worry about doing it well, just do it. Don't worry about writing a bestseller, just write. Don't worry about making a Grammy winning hit, just make music. Don't worry about failing, just keep showing up and trying. At first, all that matters is that you do what you really want to do. From there, you can learn from your mistakes and over time, get to the place where you really want to be. The truth is that we actually do not accomplish great feats when we're anxious about whether or not we will indeed be, it will indeed be something impressive and world changing. We accomplish these sorts of things when we simply show up and allow ourselves to create something meaningful and important to us. Instead of perfectionism, focus on progress. Instead of having something done perfectly, focus on just getting it done. From there, you can edit, build, grow, develop, and develop it to exactly what your vision is. But if you don't get it started, you never arrive. Limited emotional processing skills. All right. Okay, so try to go for a few more pages maybe like 10, probably. And uh, we might have a break because chapter two goes all the way up to page 60, like almost 70. Limiting emotional processing skills. In life, there are going to be people, situations, and circumstances that are upsetting, uh, infuriating, saddering, and even enraging. There will likewise be people, situations, and circumstances that are inspiring, hopeful, helpful, and truly offer purpose and meaning in your life. When you are only able to, to process half of your emotions, you are stunt yourself you start going out of your way to avoid any possible situations that could bring you up, that could bring up something frustrating or uncomfortable because you have no tools to be able to handle that feeling. This means that you start avoiding every risk and actions that would immediately change your life for the better. In addition, and inability to process your emotions mean, means you get stuck with them. You sit and dwell on your anger, sadness, because you don't know how to make them go away. When we can only process half of our emotions, we ultimately only live half of, of the life we really want to. And how to resolve this? Healthy emotions processing looks different from everyone, for everyone, but generally involves these steps. Get clear on what happened. Validate your feelings. Determine a course correction. First, you need to understand why you're upset or, or the reason why something is bothering you so much. Without clarity on this, 
you continue to waste your time mulling over the details without really understanding what's hurting you so much. Next, you have to validate how you feel. Recognize that you're not alone. Anyone in your situation would probably feel similarly and thus, and that what you feel is absolutely okay. In doing this, you can allow yourself physical release, such as crying, shaking, journaling about what you feel or talking to, to a trusted friend. Once you are clear on what's wrong and have allowed yourself to fully express in the, the extent of your emotions, you can determine how you will change your behavior or, or thought process so you can so you get an outcome that you really want in the future. Justifications. Your life is ultimately measured by your outcomes, not your intentions. It is not about what you wanted to do or what you would have done but didn't have the time. It's not about why you thought you couldn't. It's just whether or not you eventually did. When you're in a pattern of self-sabotaging behaviors, behavior, you're often treating those excuses the same way you would treat measurable outcomes. You're using them to make yourself feel momentarily satisfied, using them as a replacement for the accomplishment itself. When you have a goal, a dream, or plan, there is no measure or intent. It is only whether you did it or did not. Any other reason you, you offer for not showing up and doing the work, simply you starting, stating that you prioritize the reason, that reason over your ultimate ambition, which means that it will always take precedence in your life. You may also be using excuses to help navigate away from uncomfortable feelings that are ultimately necessary for your growth. How to resolve this? Start measuring your outcomes and focusing on at least doing one productive thing each day. It's no longer about how many days you really wanted to go to the gym. It's about how many days you did it. It's no longer about wanting to show up for your friends. It's whether or not you did it. It's no longer about the great ideas you had about how to change your business. It's about whether or not you did it. Stop accepting your own excuses. Stop being compla compla complacent with your own justifications. Start quantifying your days by how many healthy, positive things you accomplished. And you will see how quickly you begin to make progress. Disorganization. By living your lives in spaces in disarray, or just, or not just mindlessly forgetting to take care of all surroundings. We're often actually creating distractions and chaos that serve as unconscious purpose. A clear, organized space, both for, for work and living, is essential to thriving. This means a tidy home, clothes are easy to reach and put together each morning, a clean kitchen, and an organized desk. Paperwork should be filled in one space, your bedroom should be calming, and everything should have a home that it can return to at the end of the day. Without clean, clean, clean lines, we create few opportunities for ourselves. Nothing positive, nothing nor beautiful, flaws, flows from chaos. Deep down, we know this. Often we have, often we are self-sabotaging through disorganization. 
It's because when we feel very clean or organized, we get an uneasy feeling. That uneasy feeling is what we're trying to avoid because it's, because it's the recognition that now that everything is in order, we must get to work on doing what we need to do or we want or who we want to become. When we leave our spaces messy, we're always a few tasks or priorities away from stepping out and showing up. How to resolve this? Like anything, you need to start slow and adjust yourself over time. To declutter and reorganize, start with one room. And if that's too much, try one corner, drawer, or closet. Work on that. Not only that, and then implement, implement a routine that maintains the organization. From there, Start arranging space so that it works for you, not against you. Put something shooting on your bedside table like a diffuser. Or create an organized family calendar in the kitchen so appointments and schedules are visible to others. If you have trouble with the mail being disorganized, create a spot for it to go when it comes in each day. If you have trouble with laundry being disorganized, create a system for it and decide on a day or two that you'll do the wash and do it in a bulk, do it in bulk. You must slowly let yourself get used to working at a clean desk and eventually you will become second nature you will begin to realize that you feel, that you also feel so much less stressed and much more in control of your life. It's very hard to show up as the person you want to be when you are surrounded by an environment that makes you feel a person you aren't. Attachment to what you want, to what you don't really want. Water pause. Sometimes your dreams for your life are adopted from other people's references. In other cases, you determine what you want and then you outgrow your old ambitions. Sometimes we find endlessly to try to force ourselves to want something that we don't really want. And it always leaves us empty because it isn't genuine desire. This is different than lacking motivation or experiencing resistance. Or inability to perform is not based in fear or lack of skill. It is based on inherent knowing that this is not what we want for our lives. And perhaps we're feeling lost or unable to change our path. When you find yourself struggling with something, you have to ask yourself, do I actually want to do this? Do you want the job? Or just want how the title sounds? Are you in love with the person or you like the idea of the relationship? Are you still holding an outdated idea of what your greatest success would be? And if so, what would it look like to let that go? At the end of the day, self-sabotage sometimes functions to show us that we weren't quite on the right path yet that we need to re-evaluate re to determine what would feel best for our lives. Even if that means we disappoint some people or even our younger selves. We don't have to live, we do not have to live the rest of our lives trying to achieve some measure of success we thought was ideal 
when we were too young to understand who we were, who we, we, who we even were. Our only responsibility is to make decisions for the person we have become. How to resolve this? How to resolve this? Be willing to accept that maybe your success story doesn't look the way that you once thought it might. Maybe the kind of success you're really hungry for is to feel at peace each day or making your life about travel instead of work. Maybe it's about having thriving friendships or a happy relationship. Maybe the business you got into 10 years ago isn't the business you want to be in forever. Maybe the work you thought you'd love isn't coming as naturally to you as you'd hoped. When we let go of, of what isn't right for us, we create space to discover what is. However, doing so requires the tremendous courage to put, your, put our pride aside and see things from what they really are. Judging others. We all know that gossiping or judging other people's lives and choices is not a healthy or positive way to connect with other people. However, it does far more damage than we realize, and it sets us and it sets up barriers to our own success. If we feel bad about not being as successful as another person, we might try to find something negative about them to make ourselves feel better. If we do that every time we come across a person who's more successful than we are, we begin to associate that level of success with being disliked. When it comes time for us to take actions to move our lives forward, we're going to resist doing it because becoming more successful will create a branch reach in our self-concept. In other cases, you might have heard people who grew up around villainizing others who had money. They might have said things like, oh, rich people are the worst. Maybe they, they, they chalked all wealthy people up to being morally corrupt. The sweeping characterization sealed itself in your subconscious and how you find yourself sabotaging your own attempts to become financially healthy because you associate it with guilt or end being disliked. When we set up, when we set up judgments for others, they become rules that we have to play by to. By judging others for what we don't have or because of because we envy them, we sabotage our own lives far more than we ever really hurt anybody else. How to resolve this? Many people say that you have to love yourself first before you can love others. But really, if you learn to love others, you will learn to love yourself. Practice non-judgment through non-assumption instead of reaching a conclusion about a person based on the limited information you have about them. Consider that you're not seeing the whole picture and don't know the whole story. When you were more compassionate about other people's lives, you become more compassionate about your own. When you see someone who has something you want, congratulate them, even if it feels hard at first. It will extend back and open you up to receiving it as well. Pride. 
Pride is often involved in many of or worse decisions. Sometimes we know a relationship is wrong, but the shame of leaving seems worse than staying. Sometimes we start a business and realize we don't really like it very much or refuse to accept that we need to change or ask for help. In these cases, our pride, of, our pride is getting in the way. We are making decisions based on how we imagine people view our lives, not how they actually are. This is not only inaccurate, but it, but it is also very unhealthy. How to resolve this? To overcome our attachment to pride, we have to start to see ourselves more wholly and honestly. Instead of thinking that we need to prove to everyone around us how perfect and flawless we are, we can imagine ourselves more realistically as people who, despite our weaknesses, are trying our best. In the end, it looks far worse to hold onto what's wrong because you care about what other, others think than it is to let go because that's what's right for you. People will respect you far more if you can acknowledge that you are an imperfect person like everyone else. Learning, adapting, and trying your best. In reaching this mindset, you also open yourself up to learning. By not assuming you know everything or that you need to seem perfect, you can admit when you're wrong, ask for assistance, and lean onto others sometimes. Basically, you open yourself back up to growth and your life is better for, for it over the long term. All right. So this is the middle of chapter two. We'll record a new video to complete it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it up to this point. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Please let us know. And yeah, that's it. So the mountain is you. If you have any questions, we're available. Take care.